Welcome. I'm Nancy Wilhelms. I'm the executive director of Anderson Ranch, and I'm absolutely thrilled that you're here today. We are into such a great summer with our summer series. Lots of wonderful ideas and conversations and dialogue. And I'd like to thank our sponsors who make all these presentations possible. Aspen Magazine, AXA Art Americas, Harmon International, Kate Solomon and David Wasserman on behalf of the Weston Snowmass Resort and the Holiday Inn Express Wildwood Snowmass and Valley Valet. So let's give them a hand. And then I'd like to give a special thanks to Bunny and Charles Burson, who have sponsored today's program. Thank you, Charles and Bunny. <laughs> Bunny is going to introduce our guest speaker, speaker Arlene Sheckett. And Bunny is one of the most talented and least assuming people that I know. She's a trustee of Anderson Ranch, and she's a very important artist in her own right. Bunny was the executive director of the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities under the Clinton-Gore administration. She's been highly involved in arts and healthcare programs. Please welcome Bunny Burson. Thank you, Nancy, for asking me to introduce Arlene Sheckett. It's a great pleasure to welcome you and Mark Epstein, your husband, to the ranch. Her first visit here, and they have uh, not ever even been to Aspen and Snowmass. So I think even with all the rain, they've had such a good time that they'll be back, right? So you have her bio, so I don't need to talk about that. But uh, And you probably also know that she just opened her retrospective, a 20-year retrospective at the ICA in Boston last month. So we are really lucky that she said yes and that she's here today. She's had incredible press uh, over the years and with this show. And um, I was already looking forward to her coming here, but I had an experience last week. I walked through the ceramic studio and I saw three or four young students and I just asked them, you know, if they knew Arlene's work and their eyes got really big, and they said, absolutely. And I said, well, what do you like most about her work? And one of them said they loved her surfaces. And the other said, I love the way she has her bases so architecturally suited to the work. And the third one um, just loved the humor and experimentation in her work. The fourth one had never seen her work, but was sad not to hear her speak t this week but was on her way to Boston to see your show. So she's giving a gallery talk on July 23rd, if any of you are in Boston, but we get the sneak preview today. So thank you very much for coming. Okay, am I on? Um, I just wanted to uh, say thank you to everybody um, here at Anderson Ranch, uh, and and also there are so many people I know from my New York life and uh, other lives. So it's one you know I feel very embraced and uh, supported and taken care of. And this morning I was thinking about. Um, coming back and when I might do that, and that um, there's a playground quality to this place. And people say playground, and they, there is a slightly uh, derogatory little edge to that, that playground could be something less than, some, than, than something else. But um, it fits into the basic subject matter of my talk, which is that play is the most important thing that one can do, and that the essence of creating art and working in a studio is making the space 
dynamic, and safe enough to take risks and to discover what one doesn't already know. And within, because if you're working and you're making things that you already know about, what's the point? That's always been my view of things. So playground is exactly what one could wish for for a creative community. And I applaud everybody who's been involved in making this fabulous, beautiful, rich, uh, supportive playing field that so, many, so much great art has um, come out of. So thank you for having me as well. Um, this is another kind of playground. Uh, and uh, this is the first time, because this show did just open two weeks ago, uh, the, this is the first time I'm trying to incorporate some images of uh, what's happening for me right now because I think you can look at the book and see the, the, the bigger picture, but um, when I give a talk, I just really like to be referring to what's on my mind at this moment. And what's on my mind at this moment is recuperating from pu putting together um, this 20-year uh, survey. Uh, and of course, every artist, uh, while they're alive, resists the notion of retrospective, because uh, that just sounds a little dead. Uh, but it, it, it sort of is. But anyway, this is the ICA Boston, and this uh, is an amazing building. So when they approached me, this idea of working within this structure um, created by Diller and Scafidio over the water, um, inter really interesting light, and also, unlike a lot of museums, it has a whole skylight system on the top of the museum that we, because sculpture is able to take light, um, unlike most two-dimensional kinds of work, uh, we were able to open all the skylights. Uh, and it's only the second time since the building's been built that that's happened. So even, uh, so it's a really ethereal, wonderful, uh, wonder wonderful space. Uh, so anyway, that, that's, that's what's happening. Oh yeah, and then this. And, and so I just wanted to work into it by saying that for the last two years, I've been working on just how to create a story with the work. And so I worked with a three-dimensional model that, was, um, that, that we built, and then I worked with a, a, an animator and, and uh, was able to put the pieces in and feel what it was like to walk through the show. They gave me a completely empty space, 8,000 square feet, uh, and uh, invited me to organize you know, create rooms, not create rooms. Uh, the curator and I decided together to make it more or less chronological because that's how the show, that's how the, the museum seems to want to be organized. So the show is called All at Once. Um, and uh, and this, is the, this is the entry to that um, show, bleached out, but Bear with me. Someday I'll have better images. And, uh, and what I wanted to do with that first room was not have it be canned. Like, I'm showing older work, but I don't, didn't want it. I didn't want to show it the way it was shown, so I made a completely new installation of that. Uh, so this is, for instance, one of the pieces. And we started 20 years ago. Uh, we, cho we decided to start 20 years ago because 20 years ago uh, was when I basically threw out everything that I had done before and decided, uh, came to a working process that 
I still adhere to today. So it is the thread, it is the process, it is the way I make the work that is the basic thread that runs through all of the stuff. And um, in a very brief uh, description, I, through a, a combination of poignant life events and um, ideas about Buddhist philosophy and imagery um, and a sense that I needed to take hold of the idea of time as a major material within which I was working. I made these uh, Buddha pieces that are basically working with hydrocal, which is a kind of plaster without any armature. So I'm working with this sloppy wet material in order to find a form. And I had been doing a lot of painting before, and I had these acrylic paint skins all over my studio, and so then I collaged them on, and I saw my hands on there as, um, as part of the drawing on the piece. So these are the paint skin, you know, and the, the mushing through it, these are, you know, studio shots of those works, and the idea was basically um, that all things are fragile, I came to this sense and this knowledge that all things are fragile, but also full of joy and promise. And so I wanted my work to, I wanted my working method in the studio to mirror that idea. I, that, that if my life is about being in the studio, that the studio has to be this play place for me to discover things. Uh, and to discover the form, and that working with my version of a Buddha form it was, a, was using the Buddha as a kind of signifier of that Eastern idea. So um, it also, of course, you'll see that they are both painting and sculpture, which is pretty much going to be consistent with everything that you see, not just form, but but uh, color and painting with the form. Um, and also, you, you can see that back then I was using, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about how I'm using pedestals now, but I was really always doing that. And so, um, you know, there were, ch there, these were all mostly all about found things. And then I grew this, environment inside my studio to basically um, give me comfort at, at a uh, difficult time in my life when um, two of my best friends were dying and uh, I was also having babies. And so the collision of this notion of, of what you know, something really basic about what life is about and the realization that living in New York, everybody is walking around talking about time all the time and how they don't have enough time. Oh, I don't have enough time today, I don't have enough time tomorrow. You know, everybody's complaining and especially when you have little kids. Um, and so I decided that I was going to, that I had ex exactly enough time and that having exactly enough time meant that at whatever time I had in the studio on that particular day, be it one hour or 10 hours, I would use to make a piece. So that's the time. And it, it, it released me from um, that kind of feeling of, of desire and desperation and want. Like I, and, and, um, and so I still, you know, try to work work with that. The the that material, the plaster material, is a perfect timekeeper. It is a material that every single second transforms from a liquid to a solid, and so that in itself is a kind of um, signifier of this time passing. Um, and so it's not time lost; it's it's also time gained. 
Uh, so here, again, the way I did this installation was I asked them to build me these various planks. I had some idea of how they were going to go together, but basically we built this whole platform system on site in the moment at the ICA with all the people from the ICA freaking out. That, uh, <laughs> um, but it, it, so it, it ended up working. Um, and because I wanted, I didn't want a lot of pedestals, and I wanted the opportunity to have this thing, the, the spaces are very, very large. Uh, so this is a 40-foot room. Uh, so, and I have been working on some ideas about outdoor sculpture using f f some of these f kinds of building methods. And so I, it was a great opportunity also for me to do that. Uh, to, to try it out. And so I have these bodies of work, the Buddha, the Buddha forms, and there's Nancy Magoon's piece for those of you who were there last night, uh, and the drawings on the wall, and then the paper vases, and you'll see more. But what, what happened here was that people could walk around the whole installation, and um, in museums, the idea of, uh, this is that piece, the, the idea of protection is, is just huge. I'm sure you all appreciate how that becomes a big issue of how to get close to or, you know, keep visitors away. And so every time you're thinking about exhibiting something in the museum, part of the, a large part of the conversation is how to keep uh, people away from things, and those I did not want those stanchions on the floor, nor did I want ribbons or anything else that they wanted to have. So that structure created that, you know, opportunity. Here's another view. So it was also created this situation where people could walk around the whole thing, and walking around is one of the themes of my work as well. So in the first room, creating that um, was important to me. Um, on the left, this is an overhead view of a large in, um, stupa, a Buddhist temple that's an architectural reliquary. So you don't really go into it. It has ashes of the Buddha inside of it. But one uses the idea of walking around the thing in order to get gain enlightenment. And I love that idea, but I really especially loved, and here, here's another stupa. Uh, so the idea of walking around is something that I feel is very basic to being an artist and being a sculptor. When you're in the studio, you're walking around. Sculpture creates movement. Sculpture is a kind of choreography. Um, and that kind of choreography and acknowledgement of that is, um, is, a, is, is essential and one that, again, continues to, till today. So these pieces, these blue and white pieces, are basically, I'm going to try to simplify this a lot. Um, but they are art, they the beginning of the drawings come from studying the architectural plans, the original architectural plans of Buddhist stupas, um, and then I've they which are all over Asia, but very different, and yet the same all over Asia. Turns out the they come from mandalas and. Uh, most people, including myself, thought of mandalas as hippie diagrams, and uh, but mandalas turn out to be a kind of architecture, a sacred architecture, but an architecture of the mind. So one actually enters uh, the one of the gates and walks around and discovers a Buddha and enters another gate, and this is part of a meditation. So I was trying to bring the notion, using the blue and white, trying to bring the notion of the um, uh, mandalas actually being architectural plans back into that hippie diagram notion, and therefore made them blue and white, uh, so like floor plans. Um, they are not 
drawings on paper. They are made in a paper mill in the, and this is an image of that, in liquid paper pulp. So it's blue paper embedded into white paper. It is not ink on paper or anything like that. It is actually, the structure is the real, it, you know, the structure of the paper is the entire thing. The, this is a close up of it and within that, the air bubbles and all of the events that happen in the making of those pieces, I let be part of the drawing. Um, working like that, on and off for a couple of years, I started to f to feel that the way the that glistening paper looked when it was wet reminded me of blue and white porcelain. I had absolutely no interest in historic blue and white porcelain, but it it the it was an overwhelming sense that I I I had that I should investigate it. So then I ended up wanting to cast that those blue and white paper things into three-dimensional vases. So I brought the flat diagram back into a three-dimensional form um, um, and deconstructed the plan of the mandala and the stupa and made it round again. So I made the flat thing, the two-dimensional thing, three-dimensional once again. Um, and I used these plaster molds because one doesn't mold inside of uh, a form for paper, but around the form. So on the left, and you can sort of see the pentimenti of the blue and white, I would take it back to my studio while it was still wet, deconstruct it, reconstruct it, and then uh, make these vase forms, which I saw as um, a kind of domestic sacred architecture, like a vase is as much of an architecture that one has in their home as, uh, you know, an everyday kind of architecture. So, and, and each piece is sitting on the mold from which it was cast. And so, the other reason that I worked with that was because um, I've always resisted the idea of getting too put in a corner and labeled. So at a certain point when I started to show the Buddhas and people would say, oh, you're the person who made the Buddhas. And of course the Buddhas for me were more a performative act and a private experience in the studio rather than like I wanna make a Buddha. Uh, um, I decided that I had to mess up the vocabulary a little because I didn't want a straight reading of anything. So that's why I worked with these stupa forms and this blue and white paper at the same time and showed often the groups of work together so that there was, if, if it provoked a question, if it messed things up for people in their minds, that was really good for me. Uh, um, so I'm going to skip, you know, some stuff because, of course, I'm not going to drag you through 20 years. But the the um, I was invited to go to Pilchuk as queen for a day, you know, another like um, visiting artist thing. And I was at the time I was. Uh, wanting, I, I was doing a project that I'm not going to show, but I was interested. I was casting crystal um, into ropes, and so, and I did for an installation that I was working on. But as a, but they, as a matter of course, they gave me gaffers who were professional blowers uh, to work with um, every day. Uh, for an hour or two, and that was, I had done a little bit of that when I was in art school. I had done, I had done a couple of small projects using glass because I was always an artist who worked in a lot of different materials, but the thing that struck me the most was that, um, was again, the choreography of what it's like to work in a group um, because it's a very collaborative process. And also the fact that everybody was talking about breathing all the time, and they were talking about their breath, and you know the glass is an the blown glass is an embodiment of 
that kind of breath. Uh, so I ended up making these pieces um, which were um, addressing another part of, of the element of, of glass that everybody talks about all the time, which is how fragile it is. Um, and so I ha I, we blew a bunch of very simple forms, and then all of these are, were then um, are, are the product of being cold worked, meaning after they're blown, they're cut apart into parts. And then I worked with them as um, in the Japanese practice of stacking rocks. So they're all stacked and not joined. Uh, but to address this notion that something can be really fragile but really strong, really structural, and in a lot of ways, because it's n the parts are not joined, they had to be really secure with one another in a in you know more than more than um, if they had been joined. So um, so I I worked with these, but I was still picking a part. Um, uh, still, still picking apart, um, and I love the translucency of it, which was, again, another essential item that glass and crystal could offer me. Um, but I, and it had that stopping time part of it. But the thing that struck me the most was this sense of the hollowness and the air. And um, at, at the time, um, I, I was particularly thinking, um, because of various life matters, about the issue of breathing. Um, and so I um, liked working with the glass, but I did not like all the equipment, and I did not like all the remove from my body. And I wanted to work with something more directly. I wanted to be in the studio and having my own direct experience. So um, long story short, I started to um, make some things out of clay. And uh, the thing right away that I was focused on was that in order to make something out of clay, you have to make it hollow. So it's similar to the glass. You have to make it hollow. You cannot fire it. You cannot build it. And these are big. Uh, so you, you know, it just it just wouldn't work. Um, and I wanted also clay. This is in 2006, uh, 2007. I started to do this, but um, and this is a shot from the show. Uh, I started to. I wanted to have it be very clear that it was clay. Clay was extremely marginalized in the art world like glass, like all materials related to craft, people felt um, that it was, I'm not going to say women's work, but like off to the side, had another category of, you know, in which, in, within which um, people should pay attention to it and judge it and think about it. And I sort of love that. Um, I like working with things that are in the margins that people aren't paying attention, that much attention to because within that there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of space to grow and experiment. So, um, so I made these things and I wanted to make it very clear. So I don't know if you can see in these pictures, but all of the inside, you can see the red clay. I worked with red clay. You can see how they are... Um, constructed from the clay, and you can appreciate their hollowness. I hope that's not my phone. <laughs> it could be. Uh, uh, so this 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 piece is called "What I Heard," um, and uh, and here I, this is just a little bit of inside the studio building the work uh, and. You know, immediately just trying to build it and building it really slowly uh, because that's what was necessary. But immediately it had that body to body experience. Usually I work on the pieces for about six months um, and or a year um, in terms of building. They have to dry for a really long time because I'm not paying any attention to 
them being this, you know, uniform thickness or any of that stuff. Um, and uh, and so and here I guess you can see the the clay, and uh, so you know th this these were some of the things that that came up and um, in terms of what people refer to as the pedestals I felt like all along. Um, I mean, when I went to school, it's either on, it was either everything's on the floor, everything's on the wall, floor or wall. You know, mar a pedestal is totally marginal, terrible idea. Like, uh, and again, that terrible idea w was very attractive to me, uh, and that there had to be some interesting way of of dealing with it, but also. If you're making something that's ki kind of uh, like this would be maybe upper torso, you know, size, um, then and you want people to be face to face with it, then you have to figure out how it's going to sit. And I didn't want to have a generic answer because I feel that every time you put anything in the world, it's the whole thing. You can't say, oh yeah, look at that, but don't look at this. You have to be considering everything. So I already had, because you saw I've already had some, con I'd already worked in concrete, I'd already worked in wood. There's In this piece, I think there's you know concrete, wood, and bronze, and then the clay's on top. And it was my own little like playing of, oh, you think bronze is so important? You know, I'm putting it right under the clay. Uh, so, because the fact of the matter is bronze is just an expensive material. It's not, you know, usually you have to make a clay thing before you make the bronze thing. So, uh, so, so the um, you know that's a detail, and then this is more walking through the show, uh, and um, and then uh, of course there are huge technical frustrations. And one time I was repairing my kiln. By this time I had moved my studio. Once I had committed more to be using ceramics, I had committed my studio to um, upstate uh, and uh, was repairing a kiln. And I think I had a, a, a whole bunch of pieces had broken. And or I tend to refire things, just constantly fi refire them in order to work the surfaces. And but things. A clay contracts and expands continually, but the thing that does not contract and expand are the kiln bricks. And so these are the fire bricks that are used to build the kiln. Uh, and you'll see 23, some of them I just used straight out of the box. 23 stands for 2300 degrees, but the black rimmed ones are um, glazed. And so I said, I thought, why don't I just start glazing the bricks uh, and making and, and working with that? So um, again, you know, that became part of what I was doing, and um, I discovered that that within that again, I could enjoy my my painting activity. But then I, in putting them together, I had the opportunity to work on them um, in a collage-like format, or in this, like this piece is called, um, over here is called Because of the Wind, and then it has this nighttime. It was like from being upstate, I started to get a lot of, uh, a lot more information about the natural world, and um, I don't really like to make things that are nature, because I, I really resist that if something looks too much like it came from the natural world, I have to throw it out, because then it's just like really recognizable. So I has, it has to, for me to feel that something is successful, it has to really exist within this in-between state, where you actually can't put words on it or can't name it. Uh, I think this piece is called Tattletale. I mean, I do have to name them. Uh, and I try to have my titles avoid, uh, you know, shy away from description. Uh, but uh, because that's not where I want them to reside. 
So that piece, Tattletale, the response to that big, heavy thing, and it's, and it's actually on a kiln shelf. So I started to use the kiln shelves, which are the means of loading the things into the kiln, is then shown on this clear plexi thing, so it's almost like it's flying. Um, this piece is out and out. Uh, and, and then the, the idea of the, the kiln bricks started to rise up and become integrated into the, the forms of the sculpture. Um, so here you can see that a little bit. Here's inside the kiln. Um, uh, the possibility of ghosts. Um, and there it is, like that there, I wanted that tall thing to have a very horizontal table base. Uh, and so that, this is part of the end of the show. And, and, and so here, this, this is something that's um, in the book, but it's the idea of walking around the piece and how in a very old fashioned sculpture vocabulary, I'm very interested in how sculpture, unlike almost any other medium, can look different, can be different, is different as one moves around. Uh, and I see my mission as encouraging movement in, in the viewer. Uh, so I want that experience to be, I want the infinite languages of the three-dimensional form to blossom and appear over time if one lives with the thing. The surfaces, uh, I'm just gonna show you the uh, view of inside my studio. Uh, this is like uh, maybe m not my most fun part, but I have an assistant who helps me do glaze tests, and we do, you know, 100 a week or something like that, and just plugging away at it using the old-fashioned scientific method of this doesn't work, that we're, you know, just, you know, and there's infinite, uh, there's infinite possibilities. Like, so here is a piece when I've just glazed it, but here is that piece fired. And so one of the things that's interesting about clay is that, and, and glaze, first of all, the glaze, and this is very important and maybe can draw a um, parallel back to the paper works where I wanted the image and the, and the, the actual physical drawing to be one thing. I didn't want it to be separate. Uh, so the image is the piece of paper, and here clay does the same thing. When one applies glaze to the, the clay part, the, the glaze becomes part of the structure of the sculpture. And only, cera you know, only ceramics can do that. Uh, and it's sort of a miracle, but it messes with your brain because you're painting on gray powders and really it's blue and yellow, you know, so you really have, to, so there, therein lies a good deal of frustration but also training. And one of the reasons why um, I would use multiple firings, here's a, a, a recent piece uh, with something that relates both to clay and glaze. Oh, here, here's a little shot from oh, a tiny little. This is in my studio upstate, just for the hell of it. That was right before my other show, and then I just wanted to show that because then this is the that piece that you saw that was in that little film, um, Idol Idol. 
is and is not sound sense. And then from here, you can see into another room of the show, which are, are more paper, more recent paper works, and they're called, uh, it's from a series I've called Parallel Play. Um, so these paper pieces are also made at Judene Paper Mill, in, in, um, and they are, they be, but they begin in my sculpture studio where I cast very, I cast, make cast, use mold, um, the surface of my table at, at the end of the day. So, and then I bring those molds into the paper studio. So they have the, and they, so they are low reliefs. And the great, I have to work in these more direct two-dimensional forms as well because of what I talked about before, this frustration of not seeing color, and it's a much more immediate, direct relationship to color and form. And, and here's a, uh, a sculpture that's in there, and you can sort of see the bricks then transfer into these pieces. These are like 30 by 40. There are several layers of paper, and then I'll tear back into um, earlier sheets. Okay, this is the last part um, of, of what I'll be talking about. Um, between 2012 and 2013, for pretty much two years, I commuted to Germany um, to work at the Meissen porcelain factory. Uh, and uh, that is the town of Meissen. That castle that's, it, uh, is in 1710 where they f the, the first European porcelain was, was figured out. And then on the right is the, the um, factory. So that's in this tiny little town. And I would just walk. I had an apartment up at the castle. And I would just like walk to, from this you know, really crazy 16th century, through the 16th century town um, to this factory. And uh, it was, you know, it was pretty remarkable to, I had never worked with porcelain. I had no real interest in it, but this opportunity, they didn't ask, they just invited me, very open-ended. I didn't have to make anything for them uh, to produce. I didn't, it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't something about product. I could do whatever I wanted. Um, and so it was sort of a too good to be true. But at, halfway through me doing it, um, I came back one time and I ran into the director of the RISD Museum who said, oh, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm at the Meissen Porcelain Factory. And he said, we have the monkey band, which is this very famous Meissen piece. And I said, oh, that's great. I should come see, I should come to. He said, yeah, why don't you come do something? Because they were just realizing that their whole porcelain room, and this is a view of it, was not being really, uh, was not compelling to your average contemporary art viewer. So they invited me ultimately to come and reinstall their, their porcelain collection and, uh, and also take over a contemporary gallery. And in both cases, I mixed up the contemporary and the historic pieces um, because the work I did was using a lot of the 300-year-old molds that I found at the factory. So that was it. And so here, that's one of their, on the left is one of RISD's, uh, um, you know, historic pieces. I think that's from 1745. And then th those, that little pair is mine. Um, this is the monkey band that they were talking about. Okay, so it's just like really strange. And this is exactly how they had it installed. And then this is what I did. Uh, so, so I, um, 
a, a, a constant theme is, you know, some kind of humor, be it dark or light. And I think that the monkey band had both dark and light uh, within it, but I really wanted it to play and and be, become alive. So I made this, you know, I made these cases that that moved in and out of the walls, and uh, and and installed some of my pieces inside the monkey band and let them have fun. Uh, in the and that was at the RISD Museum. This is a view at, at my show that's up now at the ICA. Um, they the ICA requested they one of the things about them inviting me to do this show was that they had seen uh, the Rhode Island School of Design show, which um, had was way way more successful um, for the museum than they had anticipated. So. Boston wanted me to do something with their collection. With They didn't have a collection, but I borrowed some things from the Museum of Fine Arts and some things from Harvard Museums, uh, a couple of pieces, really just maybe you know, a dozen, and integrated them into my, um, in, into my room that I built specifically as a Meisen room. There, I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but what I discovered when I went to Meissen that the, was that the thing I loved the most was that everything was made from a mold. They're all, like the littlest, tiniest figure is made from a mold, and the liquid porcelain is and the, what poured into that, but the molds can have 25, there can be 25 molds for the tiniest little thing. And so the whole factory is filled with molds, and I decided as part of my project to make molds of their molds, because that was the most interesting thing for me. And then I cast their molds into porcelain, and here's something with all of the marks of, the, of use and straps and everything. Um, and here's one of my molds being pulled apart um, with their porcelain. Um, so he. It, I mean, my husband was there several times, and 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 he's seen me explain this several times, and he says it's still hard to understand. So, don't worry if you don't understand this. But I'm just gonna say that I made the molds of their molds, and this is a version of it. On the right is their mold shellac. This is the simplest one I did because it's just a one-piece thing, and then. This is the mold of the mold. This is the original object that I, I was casting from, and then this is mine. Okay, so I ultimately just translated their, whole, you know, everything that they were doing, including their whole painting scheme. And so, for instance, so you see this like weird drag. So th this is their dragon. And then this is mine. OK, so I just you know, played with what, what existed. Um, and then I made things like this, which I felt were using the dragon skin and the hair, you know, and, and then went completely you know, haywire with it. Uh, and uh, and this, this, is, this is a mold of a mold of, in porcelain, of the Asian vase, the first piece that mice in 1710 that mice in had done that little that little vase in the center is what they're trying to cast and this is part of the mold around it but i saw the whole thing as very beautiful i mean i just thought these molds were strange and wonderful industrial objects that i could make back put back into porcelain and make them you know precious again the numbers on the side i would cast this is my, you know you see the knife marks, that's how they were working with them. And then, you know, that's mine on the side. And you might remember this piece, but it occurred to me after I went back, I would go back and forth and work in my other studio, how I had been impacted with what was happening there, of course, worked its way into my studio upstate. So here's a few more views of the installation, but I just want to say that 
all of the walls are positive and negatives in the installation. So you see these rounded walls, it's all made like a mold. So when you're in the room, you actually have a sense of possibly being inside a mold, even if you might not know it. This is my studio there. Uh, I think you could feel it. You know, I think I think that it's possible to feel that. These are some of the borrowed things with the go go. You know, I mean, really went nuts with that. Uh, one's from the Bass Museum, and one's from the RISD Museum. One of these Buddhas, and they their hands move and their tongues move, and you know, their heads bob. I mean, the they there was a like a crazy amusing lightness and darkness to what they were up to. This is a detail of one of my mice and pieces glazed. This is another view of the room, another piece. Oh wait. Dancing girl with two right feet. Uh, but here is that opening curved wall, and I have this film. I found this film um, through a friend uh, who's a film curator at MoMA. That is, I'll show you right now, but it is a film uh, uh, from 1910, 1912, of um, Tableau Vivant actors acting out the um, porcelain figurines. So um, I, in my show, I have a positive and negative on either side of the doorway. You can sort of see it on the right, positive, negative of the film. Thank you. Well, Arlene, after your time at Meissen, and now a lot of time spent pulling together your 20-year survey, I'm curious to know how you get back to work and when you get back to work, what sorts of influences do you believe you'll be working with? I'm back at work uh, because that is where I need to be, to be grounded uh, and to feel, I mean, that's, that's my life's pleasure. Uh, as much, you know, as much as it is difficult, it's also what I love. And so um, I do not plan ahead. I'm just, you know, got in there and looked at things and said, okay, let me just start on this and see where it goes. So stay tuned. <laughs> uh, Great. Some other questions? Thank you. So, uh, quick question. So you've been working in your studio practice for about 20 years, mm -hmm. but it seems like in the last uh, seven years you've gotten critical recognition of your work. What do you think was the transition, or what do you think uh, got you the attention that you, you currently have? Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm not in control of critical recognition. So, um, I mean, I will say that 
15 years ago, I had enough so I could leave my teaching job. Uh, so it didn't, it didn't come all at once. Uh, but I think that's it. I think you, for an, uh, it's the slow burn, you know, that, that it's obvious that, I mean, I am in New York, I was showing, I have been showing, been part of a community of sorts. And um, so some people who were critics were paying attention. Some people were paying attention even when I didn't know they were paying attention, of course. So they were paying attention and, you know, that, and, and uh, spoke up then, but spoke up more now. I, I don't know. I don't think any artist has control over any of that. I'm just very grateful uh, for whenever and however it happens. It doesn't really change my life that much, is the truth of it. Uh, I mean, it gives me more situations to be in, but, uh, and situations are what I thrive on, so I tend to say yes to opportunities that are offered to me if they seem that they're pretty open um, and in a good spirit, you know, offered in, in, in the best spirit. Um, but uh, so that leads me into working with these different materials in these different ways and thinking, keeping things fresh. So I am maybe offered more stuff like that, but uh, my family will take note that all I do is work now. So the other, the, that is the other part of it. It's a lot of demands and a lot of work, but you know, fortunately I like to do it. Oh, there was somebody over there. I just have a question about um, what the Meissen uh, factory uh, community or the the people at the factory, how they responded to your work, and um, what that dialogue was like. Yeah, well, um, so I was not working on the floor. I think you could see I showed my studio. I was not working on the floor in the factory. The factory is very segmented, so everybody does one thing, and almost nobody, I should say, pretty much nobody knows how the whole thing is put together. I mean, it's, you know, it's a typical factory, but it particularly in a German, uh, and this is very East German, this is 20 minutes from Dresden, uh, that, that is how it's produced. And there's almost like an attitude of, we don't want to know. Uh, that said, when, they, when I started to work with the molds, and uh, the, the, I started to, try to get my hands on the best old molds. Uh, and I, they had no idea what I was doing, but I convinced them that I could go into the plaster room. I brought my assistant, who's like really good at making molds. And uh, so we were in the plaster room, and we came out, and they started to see that we were casting these. The workers were so touched to have their the things that they were doing, which are the unseen part of the factory, but to me, the most beautiful part, be celebrated. That was a great, that was a great moment. They would just laugh. They just thought it was hilarious because also, I don't speak a lot of German. They spoke mostly not any English. Uh, and so we had big communications non-verbally, uh, but I had one translator. But it, you know th that that was fine. And uh, I certainly most people mo their idea when I got there, I didn't know this was their idea, was that they were going to give me plates, and I was going to paint on them. So that that was pretty. Two years later, uh, 
So, so that, you know, we worked it out gradually. <laughs> That's good. Well, Arlene, I'd like to thank you for coming to play in our playground. Yeah, good playground. And yeah. Thank you. So, and we're thrilled that you'd like to come back. So, and everybody, on your way out, uh, the works for our live auction for the recognition dinner are installed in the gallery in the big barn building up that way. And please stop and take a look. They're fabulous. So thank you again for coming. Bye-bye. Okay.